the Ones in Future author podcast. I'm Stephanie, and I am so excited to be joined by author Paul Myla, who just released Larry Loggerhead Travels to the Sea Turtle Hospital, a gorgeous book, and uh, not just the first book. There's been several more, and I'm always thrilled to have Paul on the show because I get to see, well, sea turtles and all sorts of things. Thanks for joining me. Hi, right. see the sea turtles, okay. <laughs> I get to see the sea turtles, but I also, you know, to, to me, you equate summer because <laughs> we're always about diving and, you know, you, you really dive. You know, I just float on the top with a snorkel mask on. Well, you can still see a lot of stuff that way. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I used to snorkel. I still snorkel a lot. So you can see tremendous things snorkeling too. You know, there's nothing to be, uh, you know, poo-pooed about. It's all great stuff. It is all great stuff. And uh, for anyone who's never tried it before, um, snorkeling is super easy. You know, you just kind of, you just kind of float on the top. Mm -hmm. And if you're someplace wonderful, it's like, it's like swimming in a fish tank. I tell people, if you can, if you can, if you can kind of float, you can snorkel. And if you're a little apprehensive, you know, you can always get an inexpensive, sometimes they have a rental vest where you go, a little right. vest you can put on uh, that takes the anxiety out of, gee, I can't touch the bottom, you know, if that's the, if that's the issue. So, and you just float along and you know, relax and uh, watch the sea life go by. So for anyone who doesn't know you, um, Paul is a underwater photographer and a scuba what do you call what you are? A uh, scuba fanatic, no, scuba diver. <laughs> <laughs> a scuba fanatic, I guess. And uh, in my view, uh, he had all of these unbelievably fabulous pictures of animals and decided to become an author. Maybe it was the other way around, but he, he takes great pictures and has made fabulous books out of them. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the pictures, I'm sorry. The, the, uh, the, the pictures of the book. Uh, the books actually, well, you know, my writing came first. You know, I was always taking pictures on the side, just you know, as a, as a as an underwater photographer, yeah. uh, just taking pictures to enjoy taking pictures. You know, it's like if you didn't come back with pictures, you didn't see what you saw. So I had to take pictures. You know, so you know, and I enjoyed writing as you know as a writer. And then uh, out of the clear blue sky, the opportunity you know came to to uh, write some children's book books. And I thought it was a great idea instead of using an illustrator to use some of my photos to try and tell the story. The challenge there is that you have to try and find stories that can, or photos that can like fit the dialogue, if you will, where you match a dialogue to fit the photos. It isn't like an illustrator who can just draw what, you, what you're saying. Right. You have to find a photo that goes with what your story is all about. That's the challenge. But I had so many photos, it worked. You mean you didn't go under the water and tell the sea turtles, listen, the way the storyline goes, you put your arm around her and you, do, you didn't do that, huh? I tried, but not, they didn't usually listen to me. But, uh, <laughs> but the nice thing about sea turtles, and that was one of the reasons why I decided to use them as, as the model for the story, is that unlike a lot of sea life, it's very you know, fidgety and takes off when you get close to it. Or if you, they seem to know when you point that camera at them, something's going to happen and they bolt. Sea turtles tend to kind of ignore you as long as you don't do something stupid like reach out and try and touch it or harass the turtle. And they go about their business, you know, like you're part of the background. So they let you get up close and personal, and if they're busy doing something like uh, you know one of the videos you might queue up at some point with uh, Harry Hawksbill who's eating a, a sponge there with his friends, they kind of just ignore you, and you can take pictures to your heart's content. So that 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 makes it a little bit easier. Of all the sea creatures you want to take, that's probably one of the easiest ones to photograph and get lots of different photographs of. Right. So all all of our aspiring underwater photographers out there, sea turtles, not sea sharks, turtles. Is the way to go. And, and you said something so telling here, you know, most people write a story and then they find an illustrator and say, I want a picture of this, I want a picture of this, I want a picture of this, and it works. You had these pictures and you had to kind of come up with a story that worked with the pictures. That's right. fascinating. Good yeah, thing so you had a lot of pictures. If you only had like five, that could be a <laughs> different story. <laughs> Over time, you'd be, you'd be amazed how many you have, especially now with you know, digital photography. You know, it used to be with a film, you had either 24 or 36 shots and you had to kind of budget them during your, during your dive or your snorkel. And you might let a couple of shots go by because you were saving some for the end in case that the greatest thing in the world showed up, which some most of you never did, you know. <laughs> and that was it. But with digital photography, you can snap away to your heart's content. Before you know it, you have like hundreds of thousands of pictures that you can kind of sort through and then, you know, work with. And, and how do you weigh out what that greatest thing is? You know, you're diving and, and this giant, you know, octopus squid comes walking by. You're thinking, 
it might get better. It might get better. I, I've, I've learned to take the opportunity when it presents itself. That was, <laughs> that was a lesson I learned the hard, the hard way a couple of times. Right, because I'm sure at some point you see this fabulous thing, you think it might get better, and then it, no, it doesn't. <laughs> That's a, gee, where, where did I see that great thing before? You know, and you go back and it's gone. So, you know, lesson I mean, learned. Now you're worrying me, Paul, because you said, you know, if you don't come back with pictures, you didn't actually see it. And now I have a little anxiety because when I go snorkeling next, I'm thinking, I got to take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to use well, more pictures. <laughs> no, no, that's cheating. Yeah, they, <laughs> it's, it's more fun to take your own. It really is. I don't know. Is it hard to coordinate the whole floating, kicking, swimming? Actually, I find scuba diving, scuba diving and taking pictures is easier than snorkeling. Okay. Because when you're snorkeling, you're kind of on the surface and you're kind of bobbing around because the surface, you know, has you know, waves and things. Right. And um, so it makes, you know, holding the camera a little bit, you know, up and down. When you're diving, everything is kind of calm, peaceful, as long as your buoyancy is okay and you're not, you know, kicking around. So you, you have better control when you're underwater. Okay. The second thing is that it's, you don't want to be always shooting down if you can avoid it. You want to be shooting at or slightly under to look up, you know? I get that. And if you're snorkeling, you're always looking down. Now you can take a breath and go down and then do your best and get where you're going, you know, and to take a shot that way. But it's, 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 I just find it's more challenging to take good shots when you're snorkeling than it is with, when you're diving. So that means I can snorkel and use your photos, right? There you go. No, so I'll, 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 teach you, I'll teach you how to do some breath holding and take some, take some dives and get some good shots. <laughs> so not only do, do we have gorgeous photographs in Larry Loggerhead but, and in the prequels, the, the two books in the series, but we also have some fabulous videos. So get us started, give us a little taste and then get us on to how Larry Loggerhead came about. Okay, well, um, we're going to talk about Larry Loggerhead first or the beginning sure. of the scene. Either way. Okay, well, let's, start, let's go back to Harry for a second. Okay, Harry. Okay, Harry. Harry, Harry, yeah, Harry Hoxfell there. helps his friend. All right, Harry Hoxfell. So, um, in, in trying to think about, you know, what to write about, that, you know, the idea of turtles came up. And this is this little short video. It's only about 15 seconds long. Illustrates one reason why sea, uh, sea turtles in general are so good to, as, as subjects. They kind of ignore you. And they also attract other creatures around them who are looking for little bits of things that the turtle's eating to float around so they can have a bite too. Sure. So when I saw this hawksbill turtle eating with all his friends around, I said, okay, we have Harry and his friends, you know, and then we'll make a story about that. All but right. this little clip here, if you're going to queue it up, shows you exactly what I'm talking about. Let's take a peek at Harry Hawksbill. <laughs> Hmm. Oh, I am dying to go diving after seeing that. That's yeah, did, did that run smoothly? It was kind of jumpy on my screen. Did it run smoothly? Yeah, it ran smoothly. Okay, good. Mind. Okay, yeah. So you saw, you know, he was just going about his day, having something to eat, and I was hanging out, not doing much, so I wasn't in his way. He, he ignored me. And you saw a few, the, there was a gray angelfish around who I think became Gary Gray Angelfish, Gary the Angelfish, and Gary Gray Angelfish in the story, and a little um, um, other little fish around there. So that was part of his entourage. That was the idea that became Harry Hawksbill. And um, when we did the first book, you know, the publisher said, we'd like to do a series um, of books. And they, they mentioned this to all their other, you know, other authors, and you know, they wanted to do a children's series. So I said, okay, well, let's see what happens going forward. I had no idea what the next book might be. Um, and which is basically par for all my writing. Every book I've ever written, whether it's just a regular you know, novel or, or one of these books, I thought it was going to be my last one because I had no idea what's going to come next. Mm -hmm. But some crazy idea comes, and before you know it, you have an idea for a novel or you have an idea for a picture book or a children's book like this. And the next time uh, that presented itself was when um, I was in Cozumel and uh, got to see uh, turtles uh, nesting and also a, a turtle nest release, which is very difficult to arrange anywhere in the world. Cozumel, Mexico is probably the best place to do that uh, because they actually, they have so many nests, they can actually kind of, they watch the nest, they can kind of time them and know, know when they're going to release. So you get, because that can take, after they've laid their eggs, it takes almost two months for the nest to hatch. 
And, and around that two-month period, you don't know exactly when it's going to happen. So it's tough to go and just hang out for two or three. You can't hang out for two or three nights. But they're able to show you that. So if you get a chance to queue up this one shot of a, of a green sea turtle going back into the ocean after she laid her eggs, right. uh, you can get an idea of what it was like to see a huge sea turtle going back into the ocean after she's laid her eggs. Fantastic. And you can see her turtle tracks. When you see turtle tracks, it looks like a tractor has been on the beach. You can see from behind what they look like as she's, as she's moving along there. And um, eventually, you know, this 300 some odd pound turtle who's experiencing gravity for the first time in maybe a year or two, gets back into the water and then she's totally weightless again, where she belongs, where she wants to be. Wow. But it's quite an effort to get up onto the beach and then take, you know, go back into the water after she's laid her eggs. So, you know, we were, we were able to actually arrange to see some turtles laying eggs and um, watching them come out of the water, it's almost like watching something from the dinosaur age, which they kind of go back to the dinosaur age, you know. But watching them come out of the water is, is an awe-inspiring experience and seeing them lay their eggs and stuff like that. And then the next little video uh, is what happens about two months later after these little turtles pop up out of the sand. And by instinct, they have to travel to the beach, to the water. And they only have so much time to do it, you know, they don't have like days, they have like within a few, a few hours to, to make it once they hatch and they want to get going. Um, which is why they ask you if you're on a turtle beach to put out your lights and things like that, because they, they're, they're, they're by nature, they're programmed to go to, the, to, to something bright. Mm. And, in the, and even at night, under a moon, the surf looks light and, you know, oh, right, okay. that attracts them. If you have lights on in, ha in homes and things like that, they'll go towards those lights and eventually die because they can't get back to the water in time. So, um, so they're programmed to make to go head for whatever's bright, and and surf is bright to them. So you'll see these little turtles scrambling to the uh, to the ocean in another short clip, and you'll you're going to queue it up. You can get a look oh, at that. He's a little this. guy. The little baby he's just, turtles. He's just hatched. This is a baby green sea turtle. He's just hatched. Oh, you know, within the within the, uh, 20 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago. All righty, let's check her out. Yeah, he's working his way to the beach. And this is after he's probably gone all, all, already like 100 feet. And now he's getting close to the water. Oh. Just a little <laughs> slide down, goes through some sargassum weed and keeps on going. And you can see how nature has programmed them to go, 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 go to that water. And he's not oh, going to give turtle, up. Come on. He's not going to give up. And this is just basically the start of their 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 trial because, luckily, they've made it this way this this far past um, any you know land predators. And here comes oh, some some of the look at all the turtles. Here come the left. Each nest has about a hundred eggs, and most of them are going to hatch. So. Um, They'll, they'll, they'll have about 100 turtles coming out. And, um, you know, the odds of survival are only like one in a thousand um, to reach adulthood. Because once they're in the water, they have to, you know, first worry about seabirds diving down to pluck them. And then they have other sea life that, you know, might want to eat a turtle, you know. So the odds are pretty, pretty much against them. But nature, you know, has provided that, you know, 100 eggs per, per nest and the turtle will, will, um, nest three or four times in one in in the uh, in a season and they might not nest every season but you know she'll lay several hundred eggs during one nesting season and you hope one or two of those turtles lives to maturity oh my you know? gosh so uh so anyway so oh that was fabulous it, to watch it, 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 to see it, it it is absolutely phenomenal can't imagine um it, it, it's, can't it's a magical imagine. moment to see that and then um so when I saw this, I said, okay, I think I have an idea for another story. Gracie Green Turtle has to find a beach to lay her eggs on. And the next book became, you know, Gracie C Green Turtle finds her beach. And the challenge there was to find a suitable beach because it has to be, uh, we, we, you know, we've overbuilt on so many beaches. We, we, every time we build a condo on a beach, there goes, you know, nesting habitat for a turtle or turtles, you know. So um, uh, they have to find a beach that's, um, you know, relatively smooth so they can get up the incline you know, not, not with obstacles and things like that. 
Um, it has to have some protection. It has to be clean. You don't want it to have plastic and garbage and all this kind of stuff around it. So the challenge in the story is that uh, we decided to make Harry Hawksbill the hero of the, of the series. So it's the Harry Hawksbill Sea Turtles Adventure Series. And why is old Harry knows where there's a good nest, a, a good a suitable beach. And in that story, he brings her up to uh, the Carolinas where they can um, uh, find nice beaches. And um, that's where, you know, Gracie nice. Green Turtle eventually finds her for a nice beach. Fantastic. So, oh my gosh. Watching too. that video and see, it made me want to help them. Did you, did you feel like you want to help them? You, you do. You, you, know, you, you have that instinct, especially when you see one get in trouble, uh, gets caught, caught up in something or whatever. Right, right, right. And um, uh, the, the sea turtle volunteer people who are in charge of that project just tell you not to touch them because one thing they don't want you to do is pick the turtle up and bring it to the water because sea turtles return to the beach where they were born oh. 25 years later, they come back, if not to the exact beach, a beach in that, very close to that area. And scientists feel that there's some kind of imprinting going on as they're making their way across the beach, whether it's the earth's magnetic field or what, whatever it is, I don't know, but there's some kind of imprinting is going on that eventually will lead them back to that beach. And if you take the turtle up out of its nest, carry it to the water and drop it in the water, the imprinting doesn't happen. So they tell you, hands off, you know. Now, obviously, if they see a turtle is upside down, stuck somewhere, it's not going to survive, they will, you know, pick it up and, you know. <laughs> all things considered, they say, you know, hands off, let nature take its course, and that's usually the best way. Oh, my gosh. It's so enlightening for, for children to read and learn about sea life. And I know you have all sorts of facts in your books all about nature and the Gulf Stream and, and different things that happen with different animals. I mean, it's just a wonderful series for kids, not just because they're gorgeous and they are gorgeous, but to learn, to actually learn. I felt like I was taking a little course in marine biology. <laughs> Learning can be fun. <laughs> I mean, the kids, the kids are really into it. When you're, sometimes I'll do a reading in school or something like that, and the questions they ask, and, and what they retain afterwards is phenomenal. You know, they, they really are very engaged and they love this stuff. So it's really, it's really great to see. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. So we had Harry Hawks, Bill, and we had Gracie, uh, right. Green Turtle, and now we have Larry Loggerhead. So right, and Larry came, out, Larry came out of nowhere. You know, I thought, you know, I don't know what we're gonna do for a third book, what, what are we gonna do now? Well, one day I was down in Cozumel with some of my friends diving. Um, Allison Dennis was our dive operator and one of my buddies, Fulvio, was our um, one of my dive buddies, and we see this truck coming along underwater. Literally, this thing was huge. Uh, loggerheads are are pretty large turtles, and uh, we see this thing. I said, "Oh wow, loggerhead!" Get the camera up, start taking some still pictures, because you never know what's going to happen, you know. <laughs> and this turtle just kept coming closer and closer and closer. So we kind of got alongside him, and we are now swimming along with this turtle. And I looked at his shell, and his shell had a huge gash in it. And obviously it was a boat strike of some kind. Um, uh, Cause what happens, you know, turtles have to go to the surface to breathe. And so they're up there taking a few breaths and boats are whizzing by. Mm. If they're going fast and you don't see a turtle, they just plow right over the turtle, you know, so it happens. So uh, took these, you know, these photos, he let us stay with us, with him for a while. And uh, eventually we were swimming against the current. You, watch, you can see in a little video you're gonna queue up. Our bubbles are going, you know, past us. So you can get an idea how fast the current is, is pushing oh, okay. back against us. And what's very interesting also, when you watch this turtle swim, he's against the current, we're against the current, okay? Well, nature has made some kind of streamlining for these animals that for every one stroke of his, of his flippers, we have to kick four or five times just to keep up. So you'll see that in the video, he'll stroke and we're there, you know, going like this to try and keep up with him until we right, you know, right. can keep up anymore. Nice. And once I saw this gash and in his, in his, in his, uh, came back and looked at the video more closely, uh, said, okay, we have a, an idea for another book. So this, this little clip, uh, we'll show you what it was like to swim with a loggerhead sea turtle. Gash right there. Oh, how awful. Here we go. Here's Larry Loggerhead. And there he goes. Now you'll see he, he strokes once with his flippers. Every downstroke, uh, my friend Fulvio there with the shorts is, is, is kicking four or five times to keep up. Yeah. And the other photographers are on there too. And you can see how fast our bubbles are being swept by the current. Mm. Uh, Larry is unfazed. <laughs> He's just <laughs> going along, you know. Um, huge. He was big, you know, and you can see at the end you can get an interesting perspective. And when one of our divers gets kind of, you know, 
in, in the distance as he's, as he's moving along. Wow. Uh, one interesting point here, watch in a second, he's going to kind of like look down for something to eat, um, like considering stopping for lunch. And uh, he's going along and he, he kind of looked down for a second, right about here. There he goes, looking down, he goes, nah, I don't think so. And he keeps on going, <laughs> you know. So he didn't really care about us. He was looking for something to eat probably. Uh, you can see the underside of his slippers are a little red and raw also, like he must have gotten really whacked. You can see under, under his slippers there, it's kind of red, along with that gash. The size of him. And you can see how thick his neck is and how big his head is. That's where they're called loggerheads. That's where they get the name from. Yeah. And uh, my buddy Fulvio was trying to keep up here at the end, and you can get a good idea of the perspective of the size of the turtle next to him. It's almost as large as a human being, really, looking oh, in the water. Oh, gosh. And, and you're right. Your, your friend, the diver, can, can barely keep up. You know, if, I, if you had that video and the diver was not in the picture, I would think, A, the turtle was not that big. And I would right. think the turtle was very slow. But in reality, the turtle is enormous and he's yes. going in a clip. They move, they move very well and they're very efficient. You know, it's, uh, we've, it's time and time again, you, you wonder, oh, here comes a turtle, let's swim along with it. And they're going into the current. And after about um, 30 seconds, you're huffing and puffing, <laughs> trying yeah. to keep up. I had no that's idea, I thought stuff. turtles were slow. Isn't that the way it goes in the fable? <laughs> that's, that's, that's the fable, but <laughs> it's only a fable. <laughs> so you saw the gash on his back mm -hmm. and Larry Loggerhead Travels to the Sea Turtle Hospital was born. Right, so that, that was the idea. And then uh, what Sea Turtle Hospital are we gonna bring him to? I don't know. So we went to one Sea Turtle Hospital. Uh, I visited a couple, basically just on for va vacation also, not just a business. And took some photos and I said, oh, this is a nice sea turtle hospital it's in the Carolinas. And we offered them, we did a rough draft of the book and we said, How, what do you think? Would you like to be the sea turtle hospital that we take Harry to? And sometimes they tend to be what you might call purists. Uh, they said, no, well, you know, we get lockerheads here, but really we don't, we don't see any hawk skulls around here. It wouldn't be realistic. So we, we're just gonna step back in the plane. Okay, you know. So another trip, uh, visited this lockerhead marine life center in Juneau Beach, Florida, and uh, talked to them about it. And um, it was, it's a, a phenomenal facility. I mean, they have, uh, you can walk around and see the tanks with tr sick turtles being treated and stuff like this, you know, and it, it's, it's a phenomenal uh, uh, facility right on the beach. And we talked to them about it and they were thrilled to help us out, um, uh, give, you know, it was good publicity for them. Uh, they helped us with some of the technical details Mm -hmm. um, as I was telling earlier, we thought we were the original <laughs> title of the book was Lori Loggerheads Going to the Sea Turtle Hospital. <laughs> until they said they looked, took a look at the video and the pictures and they said, no, this is a male sea turtle. This is, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it, you can tell by the size of the tail, it's thick and long, and he has those little hooks in the, on the flippers indicating it's a male. So we had to change the name to Larry Loggerhead instead of Lori Loggerhead. So Lori might be in a different book down the road. If I, if I ever meet a, a leatherback sea turtle, which are pretty rare, but they're- oh, Yeah, Lori Leatherback. So that, that would be, that would be a, my next, uh, that could be number four. If I, ever, if I ever meet Lori Leatherback, that'll be number four. Uh, I have no idea what the story would be about, but the, the, first I have to try and meet pictures. up with her. We'll see, so. Absolutely. Um, so that's how the, you know, the one book became two and became three. And um, you know, Best Publishing, who do, does the books, mm -hmm. uh, I think was very pleased uh, to have a, a, now a series. Well, they that are was in gorgeous. Series. Absolutely gorgeous books. If 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 anyone out there has a child or or just loves gorgeous books themselves, never mind a kid's book, these are just phenomenal. And they're great for, like you said, reading um, and schools because they have facts in them. You know, actual science. That facts. that became. Um, uh, so something that uh, some teachers and some kids uh, put us on to. Um, they said, uh, uh, I think one of my granddaughters, Ava, said, uh, Grandpa, you need a glossary in the back of the book. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, so we, we added a glossary, you know, along with, we had some, some you know, quite some Q&As, but you know, it's funny how kids have ideas. Uh, in fact, in, 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 Lori, in, the, in Larry Loggerhead, you know, I mentioned here, I have uh, test readers uh, Ava, age nine, Max, age seven, Emma, age seven, Sophie, age five, and Luke, age five, and my, my grandkids. Oh, I love it. So I said, uh, uh, what do you think? You know, you know, I gave them a, a sample copy to read about their ideas. And what was interesting, uh, Ava and Emma came up with a couple of ideas on page 31 of the book. I have a, 
this um, uh, ancient sea turtle. This is a, these are exhibits at the Loggerhead Marine Life Center. Okay. Um, and uh, it, was, it was spelled A-R-C-H-E-L-O-N. So they said, Grandpa, you have to spell it out so we know how to, we had to, how to pronounce it. Ah. They gave me the idea to, to have the, you know, to say how it's pronounced as, as Arculon, you know. Uh, so that was one of their ideas. And they also said that I had kind of a technical thing about how, they're, how, the, how the turtle's being treated. And they said, no, no, it's too complicated, make it simple. Mm -hmm. So I just said they had to check his heart, blood, and, lung, blood and, and lungs. That was it. Uh, Sophie and Max had uh, good ideas. Sophie said, I want dolphins. Can you put dolphins in the book? <laughs> the dolphin person. So uh, sure enough, I had to go through my photos. And luckily, I found uh, pictures of, you know, dolphins welcoming them, welcoming, welcoming them to, the, to the Florida oh, waters of the Sea Turtle Hospital. So that was uh, Sophie's idea. And my original ending was Harry going back into the water. I mean, Larry, Larry going back into the water. He said, I think they should meet up at the end together. So, okay, Max. So at the last book, oh. the last uh, pictures are Harry and, and Larry meeting up back in Cozumel after his shell was all healed. Oh. So it was, it was great to have them all contribute and, and give me good ideas. Grandchildren beta readers. It doesn't get any better than that. There you go. Aren't you a lucky writer? I am. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I, so many great takeaways uh, from today. Um, how one book could evolve into multiple books, even when it wasn't thought about that at the beginning. How to make a book from pre-existing material. You know, some people start with various things mm -hmm. and uh, like you started with all these pictures and that inspired you. And even how Larry was inspired because you were diving and saw that fabulous sea turtle that had the gash on his back. And that inspired a whole story. You know, so many people ask me things like, I don't know what to write about. How am I gonna get inspired? And, and you're a perfect example of go out and live your life. I think there's also another saying, especially I think, I think it might relate more to novelists, that novelists tend to steal from life. <laughs> like, you know, you see things that say, okay, I'm taking that idea. I'm gonna use that, you know, whatever. So I think if you keep your eyes and ears open, <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely right. Somebody else dying would not have been as creative as you to see the story in the making, but you did. And mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully you're going to be out. Where's the next dive trip to? Well, after the vaccine, uh, vaccine, uh, I have to get dose number one first and then dose number two. After dose number two, and once it takes effect, you have to, you have to wait another few weeks, whatever it is. Yep. Uh, probably back to Cozumel. I mean, that's my favorite place to go. But at this point, I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to go anywhere. All right. Yeah, I'm well, on the beach too long. Let's hope that uh, Paul sees a leatherback when he's down in Cozumel. And I, don't, I don't think they're down there. I have to find out where, where to find one. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've, heard, I've heard Costa Rica. I've heard uh, uh, further down in Barbados. Um, and also further, they, they tend to go up north, way up to like Nova Scotia and that way. Oh, really? uh, they're, they're, they're a wide ranging turtle. Oh, uh, they're also in the Pacific, but you know, I don't know. They just don't like Cozumel? <laughs> I guess not. I don't know. Maybe they don't know. They haven't learned Spanish yet. I don't know. <laughs> I have to learn the language. They don't, don't like, like the food. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, whatever you see under the water in Cozumel, whether it's a leatherback or something else, we'll be holding our breath waiting for the next book. Thank you. Thank you. Very, Look very forward exciting. to it. So where can we find this book? Um, okay. It's obviously on Amazon. Mm -hmm. All three are on Amazon. Uh, you can go to my website, which is milobooks.com. And also, I mentioned on, the, on my uh, website, I, I made these, I don't know if this shows up, these little oh, yes, yes. Uh, that you can, you can go right to my website, and it has download for each of the books, a little fun fact sheet where you can uh, have a maze, you can color the characters, do a word puzzle and stuff like that. Uh, they're made to go along with the books, but even if you don't have a book, you can just download it anyway, you know. So again, they're, they're on my website, uh, bestpub.com, which is Best Publishing's website. They have, you can go we'll navigate your way to the children's books right. and buy them directly from the publisher. Okay. Amazon and also mylobooks.com. Well, I'm, I'm gonna give a huge shout out for mylobooks.com because of you. all the author newsletters that I'm on, which is probably a million. Oh, Seagram. Um, okay, your newsletter, Seagram, is the yes. most beautiful thank I you. get every month. 
Um, Paul sends out a monthly seagram with pictures under the water. There's always a little video clip. There's all sorts of photos. And especially during this lockdown, there's been mm. nothing like looking at that seagram to, to remember that we're going to be outside soon. I'm having to recycle all material. I need some new adventures. So, <laughs> so right. I have to get back on the water. All right, two shots and you're out of here. I get it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for joining me. And thank next you. Up, let's get you back on here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks Good so seeing much. you guys. And everybody else, have a wonderful day.